You're welcome back. Uh, it's still the breakfast on uh, Plus TV Africa. And right now we're going to be talking about the failure of ECOWAS's diplomacy and its reflection on uh, Tinubu's foreign policy. So we know that there has been uh, a narrative going around about the involvement of the Wagner Group in Niger's coup and that this all plays into Putin's greater efforts to disrupt the West as part of his ongoing special military operations in Ukraine. How badly has ECOWAS miscalculated in dealing with the coup in Niger? And is there any room left for diplomacy between ECOWAS and Niger? Remember that Abdul Salami, Abubakar and the Sultan have been sent to go and try to negotiate. Can ECOWAS make good on any of the threats that it has made? Uh, and are there any things available to them? How big a disaster is this for President Tinubu as he faces his big test as the chairman of ECOWAS. The Senate has opposed the deployment of Nigerian troops, and they are, are there other op options available to the President Tinubu? How significant is this crisis to understanding the foreign policy of President Tinubu's administration? These and more are the questions we are attempting to answer right now on this segment of the show. And we're glad to be joined by Mr. Adebayo Loake, a consulting research fellow, African Resource Development Center, Lagos State. But today, he's just here as a public affairs analyst. I'm sure I'm right about that. So good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Loake. Good morning, Yamgu. Good morning, Maureen. And good morning, viewers. Yes. We've always talked about this foreign policy, you and us here. You know, we're concerned about what po foreign policy the new administration should, ad should adopt. Right now, we've seen the first test in uh, this coup in Niger, where our president eventually uh, is the chairman of ECOWAS, pronouncing a lot of things, saying delivering speeches that did not even go well with so many other people, especially the, uh, the country in question, which is Niger and all that. So what does, does this say about the foreign policy direction that the present administration might take? What do you foresee, if it is possible uh, to foresee something? Because they say a dog that will know how to hunt, you will know it when it is still <laughs> a, a little one. So tell us what you think. Okay, so um, I think first of all, we need to establish the fact that the policy is an ECOWAS policy. Mm. Because uh, it's going to be difficult for the chairperson of ECOWAS to single-handedly, uh, you know, initiate something if the other um, members of the authority of heads of state and government do not endorse it. Having said that, of course, the charisma, uh, personal interest, or, or, or foreign policy of, of the chairperson, you know, uh, the foreign policy of his or her country, will, of course, could be a driver, you know, in mobilizing the other heads of state. And I think it is in that regard that we have seen President Tinubu championing uh, the response to the coup in Niger. Um, now, the, I think there are lessons to be drawn from, uh, you know, what, what has been done. The first is that um, ECOWAS in, demanded a, 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 the release of President Bazoum and his reinstatement within one week. Before the expiration of the one week, ECOWAS imposed sanctions, closing the airspace of Niger to commercial aircraft, uh, suspending Niger from all financial transactions uh, within the ECOWAS region uh, and then waiting for Niger to respond uh, at the expiration of the deadline. Now, unfortunately, um, Niger, fortunately, unfortunately, Niger apparently stuck to its guns, that is the Junta uh, Brigadier General Chiani, uh, but ECOWAS also sent three delegations. The first delegation was led by uh, General Derby, current president of Chad, that's Derby Jr. The second delegation uh, was the director general of, led, was led by director general of the Nigerian National Intelligence Agency. And that delegation also had the chief of the air staff of Nigeria in, in it. And then the third delegation was General Abdul Salami Abubakar, and the Sultan of Sokoto. So 
Um, there are those who will submit that these delegations, except for President Derby, who incidentally was the only one who met General Chani and who met President Bazoum. The other two delegations never met uh, Brigadier General Chani, nor did they meet President Bazoum. So that should tell us something, uh, which is that perhaps, although Chad is not an ECOWAS member, maybe ECOWAS should have stuck with President Derby, since he had access to General Chani and he had access to President Bazoum, uh, to allow President Derby to continue the, the, the mediation, in which case he could be converted to the AU representative, concurrently AU and uh, ECOWAS representative, to continue the negotiations. But in any case, the, the junta stood these grounds. We have a stalemate. And um, this is where we are at the moment. Perhaps maybe one more point I would like to make uh, is that the way the response of uh, the possible uh, military response of ECOWAS was presented, especially in Nigeria, I think could also have been better because it was being presented as if the Nigerian armed forces would deploy alone against the junta. And in the, in the letter which the president sent to the Senate, that impression was also created. Whereas there are regional, what we call high readiness regional standby debates. There's one in West Africa, there's one in East Africa, there's one in Southern Africa. Nigeria and other ECOWAS members are contributors to the West African High Readiness Standby Brigade. And this is the instrument of coercion available to ECOWAS to effect compliance. So I find it rather strange that the impression was being created that Nigeria was going to unilaterally deploy its forces against the junta in Chad if they do not comply with the ultimatum. Even if it would have been the ECOWAS High Readiness Standby Brigade, which I think would, should have been deployed, I personally am one of those who feel that a military solution will not be applicable in the current circumstances. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but you know, like I was asking, um, the foreign policy, uh, the president didn't seem to consider what effect it will have on Nigeria as a country. It is now that he's having meetings with the seven states, northern states of Nigeria, who say that uh, they are going to be affected, and truly so, by this war if it comes. And it is now that he's trying to do some consultation, which he didn't do before making that pronouncement as if Nigeria was at war with Niger. And what I'm looking at also is, I'm asking myself, if it were Buhari, for instance, that had relations, as it were, with Niger, would he allow this as a, a, a COAS chairman to happen? Would he even allow this kind of pronouncement to be made by any other person, even though it is not himself? So that shows the power of the chairman of the ECOWAS as at this moment. But Tinubu went ahead and made it. Does this not show that there, must, there may be problems when fashioning out foreign policy for Nigeria without, because this has shown that there was no much consideration about how it will affect Nigeria and, and the people of Nigeria. So don't it, doesn't it worry you that it may also be replicated when this foreign policy is being formulated, which I think may not have been done by now because we would have seen uh, the direction of it right now. Does it not worry you? Yambu, you're asking me so many questions. <laughs> me, I, I have too many, try. too many in my yeah, heart. Let, 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 let me just try to um, be logical. Number one, regardless of whoever was Nigeria's president, we have the ECOWAS protocol, which says you cannot come to power through military means. When President Eyadema of Togo died, the military in Togo immediately pronounced his son Fore Eyadema as president. ECOWAS said no. Obasanjo was president at the time. And ECOWAS insists, and the military in Togo said, we have put in there, there's nothing you can do. And ECOWAS said, fine, we will put our regional standby brigade on standby. And immediately, the military set up an interim government, conducted an election, and Fore Eyadema was declared winner of that election. Okay? When President Buhari was head of state, 
President Yaya Jame of the Gambia lost an election, congratulated Adama Barrow, who was the winner, and one month later he changed his mind and said he was not going to leave office. ECOWAS immediately put his high readiness standby brigade on standby and actually deployed it, which forced Yaya Jame to leave. So regardless of who, who the chairperson of ECOWAS is, the fact is that you cannot come to power, according to the ECOWAS protocol, through unconstitutional means. Mm. So I, I don't think President Tunubu did anything out of the ordinary. The question is, were the right things done to give effect to the ECOWAS protocol? And that is where you may have different opinions. I feel that uh, proper consultations may not have been made, including with the military chiefs. Because several times, and I'm not, this, this doesn't have to do only with President Tinubu. Several times we've seen leaders, and not just African leaders alone, leaders in other parts of the world, take political decisions that they need to give vent to by deploying their military without consulting their military. The war in Ukraine is also an example. The leaders of the North Atlantic bloc, they took several decisions, including sanctions and so on and so forth, without consulting relevant people. And they had to begin to deal with the aftermath of those decisions. So that's the first thing, or rather the second thing. You know, Next is the fact that, yes, internal consultations with Nigerians who are likely, not just Nigerians, even other Africans who are likely to be, West Africans who are likely to be affected, you know, by the decision of ECOWAS, consultation with other Africans as well who may be affected. Remember, Niger, uh, Chad has borders with only three ECOWAS countries, if my geography is correct, Nigeria, Mali, Benin Republic. It has borders as well with non-ECOWAS members, Algeria, Chad, Libya. So if you will impose sanctions on Niger, you needed Algeria, Chad, and Libya to be on board. The sanctions had been imposed before the Niger ECOWAS now set up a, a committee. I remember Ambassador Babagana Kingibe was dispatched to Libya and Algeria while General Abdul Salami and the Sultan were dispatched to Niger. That was way after the sanctions and a few days to the deadline. So, yes, I feel that certain consultations ought to have been made because Niger is not uh, Burkina Faso or Guinea, which is surrounded by ECOWAS countries, which therefore makes it easier to impose sanctions which ECOWAS members will effect. In the case of Niger, that is very difficult. Okay, let's look at what ECOWAS stands to lose, what is risking with its inability to uh, solve this problem, especially now that there's a, there appears to be a stalemate. They issued a warning and even threatened military action, yet um, their words and movements and actions or inactions have not been able to, uh, to bring the desired result. What do they stand to risk? in terms of their reputation as, an, as a group or as, as an organization? Very good question. I think, first of all, ECOWAS might lose its credibility in the sense that the junta in Niger has been able to spin a narrative that France is threatening to attack Niger. They were not even saying ECOWAS is coming to attack Niger. They said France is coming to attack Niger. And you could see the effect of that, the way Nigerians reacted. Uh, they went to the French embassy. They destroyed the French embassy. So invariably, they are suggesting that ECOWAS could be an instrument in the hands of France to carry out the invasion of Niger, which is not good for ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that the, the comments from leading, especially the foreign minister of France, you know, in the lead up to the expiration of the deadline, in my own opinion, did not help ECOWAS's position in the sense that knowing fully well that France is not popular at the moment, whether in English speaking Africa or in French speaking Africa, the foreign minister of France kept saying, We are supporting ECOWAS, we are with ECOWAS, thereby reinforcing the narrative of the junta 
that ECOWAS might be the instrument of France to carry out a new colonial action on the citizens of Niger. The second thing is that um, last year I wrote, I wrote an academic paper where I argued that ECOWAS needed to rethink its response to coups because ECOWAS is so predictable. If there's a coup, it just imposes sanctions, it suspends the country from financial transactions in the sub-region, and then it gets the AU and the UN to pass resolutions endorsing its action. And I felt that because of the effect of the coronavirus pandemic, which created a devastation on the economy of many countries around the world, including developing countries, because of the security vacuum in Libya following the removal of Colonel Gaddafi, and because of poor governance in, in most of the countries in the sub-region, worsened by the effects of COVID-19 on their economies, you know, we, we were likely to have a lot of stress on the political architecture of the region. And therefore, we might see attempts at unconstitutional changes, which meant that ECOWAS will rethink its strategy and its diplomacy. I don't think that was done. I think a few people also echoed similar sentiments, but nothing in that direction has been done, as we can see in Niger, because they went the same way they went previous. And, but now Niger is too critical strategically for this kind of military response to be initiated. Well, the, I'm, I'm afraid for the future of, um, of ECOWAS because this is one-fifth of the uh, members of ECOWAS that have gone out. Mali was there, Burkina Faso, now Niger. And there is a possibility that another state might, might, might join. I, I don't know how you see uh, this playing out in the nearest future. Does it mean ECOWAS is weakening or there's a possibility they can bounce back stronger than ever? They will not need ECOWAS because these countries need ECOWAS more than ECOWAS needs them. Um, if you look at the aggregate, I mean, okay, because of time, but if you look at the aggregate economies of these countries, really, um, the, the ECOWAS has been more of a, of a benefit than uh, a negative, you know, for them. Um, if you look at the, the Colonel Asimi Goita in Mali, Captain Ibrahim Traore in Burkina Faso, uh, Colonel Dumbuya in Guinea, not one single one of them until this Niger crisis ever said they would leave ECOWAS. ECOWAS demanded that they must set up transitional governments. And Asimi Goita is the president of the Transitional Council of Mali. Ibrahim Traore is the president of the Transitional Council of Burkina Faso. Colonel Dumbuya is the pre president of the Transitional Council of Guinea. So they are complying with ECOWAS. They see benefits in ECOWAS, and they accept that military rule is not acceptable. They have argued that for some extre extraneous reasons, they had to take power. But they are complying nonetheless with the transition plan. I think that it is the failure of the ECOWAS leadership to rethink its diplomacy and its strategy that is making these three countries threaten to leave. But I don't think they would be. And I think there's a brighter future for ECOWAS. Okay. okay, let's look at the importance of ECOWAS. ECOWAS, since it was created in 1975, um, how, how, how useful? You said they benefited more from ECOWAS. Um, but how useful would you say ECOWAS has been to the region? Uh, especially when you take into... Uh, cognizance all that um france is said to be doing to the the countries that they colonized how how effective would you say uh, or what have been the usefulness of ECOWAS? and would you say that ECOWAS has succeeded in um building the region that they they, they, they represent um ECOWAS has been extremely useful ECOWAS is, the West African sub-region, is started to be a model of regional integration in the world. ECOWAS was the first to introduce free movement of persons, long before the European stock of Schengen. ECOWAS countries have been moving, up, moving about without visas. ECOWAS has worked towards harmonization of telecommunications, harmonization of... Um, uh, communications, including we all drive on, you know, uh, we have similarity in our driving patterns. We have integration in road network. 
even if some of our roads are bad now. ECOWAS has also enhanced uh, community bonding and, 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 and uh, uh, to, to strengthen the various uh, economies. But what about ECOWAS security, bank. though? Yeah, time will, not permit us, uh, time will not permit us to, 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 to actually uh, spend more time on this. But what about security? When you look at the security in the Sahel region, how successful would you say ECOWAS has been in, in dealing with the issues of security, which is on the rise, and which is one of the reasons why the military boys are coming in? For security, states still have their sovereignty. States have not so surrendered their entire sovereignty to ECOWAS. So if ECOWAS is not invited, it cannot provide security. Do you remember when Captain Sanogo came to power in Mali? ECOWAS offered immediately to help contain the Tuaregs. He said no, because the American Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. She told him, no, we don't want ECOWAS to come here. Much later, of course, ECOWAS had to deploy, and they successfully uh, convinced the Tuaregs not to fight anymore. Unfortunately, Islamic in, in the Maghreb filled the vacuum that was created. But ECOWAS has, has been succeeding in terms of security. Liberia, Sierra Leone were global successes for ECOWAS. But if a state does not invite ECOWAS, there's nothing ECOWAS can do. So in the case of Niger, who invited ECOWAS? Niger is a member of ECOWAS, which meant that Niger accepted the ECOWAS protocol, which says that there can be no unconstitutional change of power. Mm -hmm. And the consequences are known if there is an unconstitutional change of power. So up to that point, ECOWAS is right. The question, like I have said, is ECOWAS did not strategize properly. Or rather, ECOWAS could have better strategized and could have better enhanced its diplomacy. We haven't seen diplomats, for example, talking to people in Niger. Rather, we have seen former leaders who have military backgrounds. We have seen intelligence people. But we have not actually seen diplomats. And some people are asking the question, why did ECOWAS not set up a, 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 a delegation comprised of diplomats to go and negotiate. Why sending people who, did, who do not have any diplomatic leverage? Some have even said that if this was what ECOWAS was going to do, why didn't they send President Buhari to Niger? They would listen to President Buhari in Niger. Yeah. Okay, well, just to round off, um, I'd like to... Uh, you to speak on what the takeaways can be for Nigeria from this uh, when formulating our foreign policy. What are some of the things that we should learn a lesson from this ongoing crisis in Niger and help us formulate that for foreign policy that will be beneficial to us? Just a few things and then we wrap up. Okay. We have, we have a foreign policy. The question is to tweak it to conform to the changing dynamics in the international system. And our foreign policy has to have maybe a three concentric uh, uh, dimension. One is our sub-region, two is our continent, and then three is the world. Mm -hmm. Second point is that I think it, will, it, it hasn't helped the president of Nigeria trying to respond to diplomatic issues without an ambassador, uh, sorry, without a minister of foreign affairs. And there's no minister of foreign affairs. So the quality of advice that the president has been receiving could be suspect in the absence of a foreign minister. And I think going forward, given the dynamics in the international system right now, whoever will be the foreign minister of Nigeria, that job should not be given to just anybody. The international system now is extremely dynamic. Whoever will be appointed foreign minister, in my opinion, has to be young, probably from a former ambassador, a former diplomat, and must be able to travel regularly and consistently. Because this, the, the times now are extremely uh, dynamic. And then I think lastly, the opinion of Nigerians should be, should, filter, should be filtered in the tweaking of our foreign policy so that our core national interests are not jeopardized. Mm. Okay, Mr. Lowake, we'd like to say thank you so much for coming on the show and helping us make sense of this uh, topic. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.
Thank you. We've been talking with Mr. Debayo Oluwake, Consulting Research Fellow, African Resource Development Center, Lagos State. We were talking about uh, foreign policy. We were talking about the issue in Niger and all that. Uh, this is where we intend to draw the curtain for today. We do hope that you had a wonderful time uh, watching this program today. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. And I am Maureen Menonwezigwe. Thank you for being there. Have a great day.